Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. I'm Josh Mailman. I'm the president of NorCal Carsonet Community and a member of the NetRF Board of Directors. Want to welcome you here today to Speaking Up, Know Your Net, at the Know Your Net conference. Want to really talk to you today about how to talk to your doctors, some of the troubling and challenging conversations we have with our physicians about neuroendocrine tumors, whether you're newly diagnosed or you're an old hand at this. I want to also talk a little bit about speaking up and using your voice to talk and advocate on behalf of those with NETS as well. So these are my disclosures. Um, this tour that I'm talking about, the Speaking Up tour, was funded by Lexicon Advanced Accelerator and Ipsen back in 2019, and we'll go forward. Here's today's topics. Most of you or many of you know me, but I'll give a quick background. Talk a little bit about speaking up when you're at a doctor's appointment. We'll talk about advocacy in speaking up. And I wanna show you how much patients can make a difference. A bit of background, I was diagnosed in 2007. I've done a lot of things over the last 16 or so years. There are articles that you can find, whether it's the ASCO post talking about living with a rare cancer, the Journal of Nuclear Medicine and Channel 4 in DC did a background of me uh, last year and you can just find that by pointing your phone at that bit.ly and clicking on it and you'll see that video. So again, in 2019, 2018 and 17, I started doing something called the Speaking Up Tour. Wanted to talk to patients around the country about the challenges they were having talking to their medical team. And this tour actually made it almost to 14 cities around the U.S. Um, before in 2020, it was uh, canceled for the pandemic. We recently picked it up. I did a speaking up tour in Jupiter, Florida earlier this year. These are all the places we went. Uh, the District Arts in, is in Houston. That was uh, speaking up, was in Cleveland. We've been all over the country. So why do we talk about communications and speaking up? Well, our physicians talk about how to cure a disease and they don't necessarily talk to us about treating people. And we have our own sets of questions. And sometimes these are a little bit different for all of us. And so our doctors may be interested in one thing, but as patients, we may be interested in another. And honestly, it's challenging to be a patient because you have about 15 seconds to set the tone of your interaction with your healthcare team before their preferences and where the conversation are going to take over and they will start talking. So that is one of the challenges of working. You know, we're getting information. We weren't prepared to be a cancer patient, so we're receiving information through a fire hose and we're learning a lot of new words and that's what i want to talk to you about a little bit here in the next um, few minutes so again i did this back in 2018-19 we had an article on how to talk about cancer that was published in cure how to describe your symptoms what are our challenging conversations and tips and tricks and real world experiences and some of the things that we're uncomfortable about talking to to our physicians. I like using this slide to describe it because our physicians are talking one way and we're, this is like when we were kids and we're receiving another. And even when you talk to fellow patients, it's really important to make sure that you understand what they're saying because good communication happens when the listener and those who are giving information and the receiver both have a feedback loop so they can make sure they're understanding what is being said. What I often find, and I've done this in conferences before, is that we hear a lot of medical terms and then when we translate them back, we don't understand them or we understand them differently than they were intended. If you look at some of the tips and tricks that were in the article that um, I presented above, one of the, the real important things to do is to one, take notes, and two, if it's okay with your physician to record it, because often 
even if you have two people in a room, they are going to hear things differently. And it's good to be able to go back and listen to what was said. Again, one of the things, especially if you're newly diagnosed, is learning how to talk to your care team or what are the overriding questions that you're interested in. We'll talk about overriding questions in a second, but I just wanted to put up the NetRF newly diagnosed page, which you can look here using this QR code, but these are some of the topics that you should learn to talk about and feel comfortable talking about. Again, you may not always talk to your doctor. You may learn to talk to your um, nurse practitioner or other members, radiologists and technologists who are doing your scans. You need to learn how to optimize and to have that information ready at your fingertips that, of questions you want to ask. We'll talk about having the single overriding communication objective, which is really important. When you're going to an appointment, whatever type of appointment, if you do have questions, Write them out, write them out in the order of importance so that you can actually get the question that's most important to you asked first. So doing speaking up, doing the tour, we asked um, various different groups um, what were the challenges they faced. And this is a subset of answers that we got. It represents one of the challenges that you have in talking, that people feel uncomfortable talking without feeling like they're being a hypochondriac. Patients feel that there's a lack of knowledge with their physician on nets. Technical questions can sometimes be brushed off. So one of the things that really is important is having this single overriding objective, get the question out that is most important to you and have it asked first. If you look at the NetRF on the newly diagnosed is asking for second opinions. And one of the things that patients feel, well, about half of the people in this particular speaking up event felt comfortable asking for second opinions. A great number of people did not feel comfortable asking for second opinions. And you should know that your doctors are okay with you asking for second opinions. We've actually done this with healthcare providers and all the net specialists that we've run into are certainly comfortable in having you ask for second opinions. When you do that though, try to understand what it is that you would like out of the second opinion so that you can make that second opinion valuable to you as you go through your net journey. So again, here we are looking at, do you have enough time to describe your symptoms? And about half the respondents, and we again, we did this in over a dozen cities, and this was consistent throughout the, the cities we visited, that half the people feel they have the time and half don't. And again, this comes down to writing down what your experience is being able to document them so you have the ability to describe them in greater detail and making sure that if symptom management is important, that this is the overriding concern you talk about. I found this interesting because actually in doing this in Jupiter, Florida this year, it was slightly different. And this may be that it's been three or four years since we last did this. But um, in 2018 and 19, the majority of us tracked our symptoms in our head. And the problem with tracking your symptoms in your head is when you get to your physician to try to describe your symptoms, you're not really able to do that because you focus on what happened in the last 24 or 48 hours, or they're not an accurate remembrance of what was going on. I suggest using a notepad or a mobile app to track it, what was quite interesting is actually in Jupiter it was the first time that using a notepad uh, reached more than 50%. So really, if you're having symptoms and things you need to describe in frequency to your physician, write it down. Put it somewhere where you can say, this happened this many times and I have a record of that. It really helps your physician and your healthcare professionals understand how important this is and how frequent it is actually happening. So I've talked about this a little bit. If you go back to the article that is in Cure that has um, more tips and tricks, 
the most important thing to think of when you go to your physician is to have a single overriding communication objective. Something that you want to get, make sure that it's answered before you leave. Make sure that you just don't have a list of questions, but you have a prioritized list. Some patients find it easier to write this out in my chart so their physician has it beforehand and can um, say, here are the answers to the top three or four questions that I'm able to get for you. Or a physician's assistant may have these answers for you before you even come to your appointment. So I've talked about speaking up during your doctor's visit, but I also wanna talk about speaking up and changing the world or changing the world we, we live in for other net patients. This normally is under the heading of patient advocacy and patient advocacy can be a whole host of um, different ideas. And I actually asked healthcare providers what they thought at a conference I was on last year what a patient advocate does, and they can do a wide variety of things. And this is another little diagram that we have is what patient advocacy is from a research advocacy perspective. And there's so many pieces to the puzzle. But for me, and why this is important is patient advocates see things differently than their doctors do or the healthcare industry does. And so by being able to provide our insight helps magnify our voices so other patients can benefit from that. This is the NCI definition of what a patient advocacy does. Um, and just so you don't have to be a scientist to be a patient advocate, whether it's for awareness or research or to provide input to the healthcare um, industry, we just need to be able to describe what is happening as a collective. So I'm giving you a few things here to think about. You can change the world by working and supporting your local healthcare professionals research. You can help out a local patient organizations. You can work on policies that impact you. ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, has guidelines that are always open for review for you to comment on. You can fund research and young investigators through NetRF, and you can think globally and enter clinical trials that will help benefit others so that your voice, your experience will help actually dictate care or inform care for those in the future. I want to give you one last thing. This is from the NetRF's clinical trial finder that uh, was actually funded by patients. NorCal Carsonet and Encora um, worked on this together so that we could actually have something that was tailored to neuroendocrine tumors. And NetRF is using this on their site so that you can find an appropriate clinical trial. And this was all funded by patient donations. So even the littlest bits can help change the way patients get cared for. And with that, I want to thank you for giving me a few minutes um, of your time today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.